So welcome everybody. I'm Daniel Shoemaker. I am uh, served last year as the chair of the SNFs and Hyper user group. And this is our inaugural breakthrough symposium. And we named it a breakthrough symposium because we wanted to highlight breakthroughs in science and so new capabilities, um, but also because we wanted to make the capabilities and experiments that you can do with neutron scattering more widely known to the community. Um, and so one way to do that was to have a set of focused talks on specific science topics. Um, and the SNS Hyper User Group Executive Committee got together. And so this is our committee for this year. We're well represented between university and national laboratory users and scientists. And we thought that it would be great to, you know, broaden the user base of especially uh, framework material and MOF researchers and their representation in neutron sciences. And so we put together this symposium that we're going to share with you today. This is going to be recorded. So if you forget anything you see, please watch it online and distribute the recording widely to your groups and colleagues. And um, we're first going to hear from uh, Joe Zhao at Texas A&M, uh, Craig Brown from NIST, and Mercedes Taylor at the University of Maryland, and then Hayden Evans uh, from NIST again. And so I want to keep this thing running on time. If the panelists uh, want to chime in at any point, they can. If you have questions, drop them in the Q&A, and we'll, we'll try to take a brief break for any questions uh, between the talks. But for now... Uh, we have half an hour, and so uh, Joe, if you'd like to share a screen and do just a quick blurb about yourself, feel free to get started. Okay, so can you, uh, okay, good. Once you stop, I can actually, so uh, can everybody see my first slide? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, it's great to see everybody uh, especially old friends. Uh, so it's been a long time since we see each other in person. So hopefully everything will open up. So uh, today uh, for this uh, breakthrough symposium, I, I like to talk about the utilization of neutron techniques in the evolution of MOFs, uh, MOF-based materials. So this is actually a collaboration between my group and uh, doctors. Uh, Catherine Page and uh, uh, Matthew Ryder. So uh, let's uh, get started. Yeah. So I, I think overall, like uh, this type of uh, self assembly work is uh, inspired by nature. Uh, in nature, but, uh, guided by non covenant waking directions, the biomolecules such as uh, the double helix of DNA align themselves through spontaneous self-assembly. Uh, this assembly is highly efficient and also very accurate. So for this uh, metal organic framework uh, materials, I'm preaching to the choir here. So uh, they are porous materials based upon organic linkers and metal nodes and the crystallinity, porosity and the structure tunability uh, the essential or the hallmark of uh, MOFs. So how do we actually, uh, you know, take advantage of that or transfer this type of uh, order or crystallinity, or porosity, and structure for uh, tulability to, you know, MOF derived materials? Meaning that we use MOF as a template. For example, this so-called MOF derived carbon. We actually started uh, in about 2008 when uh, Chang Xu of uh, uh, Japan University of uh, uh, Kyoto University right now, uh, working on this MOF derived carbon for supercapacitors. But later on, uh, this uh, field is actually developed really quickly. So here I'm actually listing some of the the characteristics of uh, MOFs and the MOF-derived carbons. 
is spelled with me. Yeah. So uh, from the SEM picture uh, of the morph here, right? And also uh, after carbonate, thermal carbonization, right? So uh, the overall morphology seems like it's not changed at all, right? So the top one is is not carbonized. The, the bottom one is carbonized, right? But however, when you take a TM picture there, right, you can see this uh, domains of metal oxide and the graphitic carbon. So it's a composite material that is quite different from the original morph. Inter internally, they have this order, right? This crystal structure shown there. So uh, morph often uh, decomposes around 350 degrees Celsius. Susceptible, uh, susceptible to dissolution in coordination solvents. But uh, on the other hand, once you carbonize them, right, or use uh, calcination, right, you are going to get this uh, uh, morph derived carbon. It's a morphous material that maintains the bulk morphology of parent morph. You can tell from here. And then the thermally stable to higher temperatures often around 800 degrees Celsius, and the tunable porosity and the well-dispersed metal oxide phases. So the domains of metal oxides is very clear in the TM picture, and it's chemically robust. Because after you calcine this, right, at a high temperature, so the volatiles were chemically uh, relatively speaking, unstable materials is gone. So uh, that can be used as a catalyst to support or as a catalyst itself because you already have metal oxide embedded in the morph derived carbon. So uh, why we, we actually work on this, right? Because they are very useful in uh, catalysis. Uh, it has this, uh, you know, tailorable morphology, hierarchical porosity, easy to functionalize, right? And also with heteroatoms like a nitrogen, right? Minute, it's actually quite important, right? Uh, for, for example, later on we'll talk about, let's say, uh, CO2 reduction. You need uh, carbon atoms to coordinate to the uh, single atom catalyst, right? For electrical catalytic reactions. And also this metal, metal oxides in the uh, morph derived carbon, making them highly efficient as catalyst or as catalyst support, right, for numerous important reactions. Here we actually show some of those. One of those is the facial chop synthesis, which, you know, you, you start from, uh, let's say, syngas, and then you go to make a higher or longer carbon chain over there, right? So uh, in the future, for example, if uh, let's say we generate a lot of this uh, thin gas based on recycled waste, for example, or like uh, agricultural products, and then you know you need to you know go all the way to some of this uh, let's say propane or ethylene, right? And then you can make your plastic and and, and rubber, right? So, uh, so facial charge reaction is extremely important, right? Also, this uh, ORR reaction. The ORR reaction uh, using like uh, electrocatalysis, right? It's been uh, a topic in this uh, field uh, for a long time. 2015, I show a literature out there, but it's been actually quite a popular topic right now. You know, as a sort of associate editor, for even organic chemistry, I receive a lot of this uh, uh, submissions on this topic. Also, the catalytic oxidation, as well as uh, as you can tell from here, right? This uh, uh, the uh, reaction is a nature communication paper that right uh, actually shows that uh, you know. You, uh, you can actually make a long chain carbon out there using this fissure trophic reaction. So, uh, uh, when we have a, a solid state material, oftentimes, you know, 
we, we want to know the structure and then we can establish the structure property relationship out there, right? But uh, for MOF, it's very straightforward because uh, we can grow single crystals most of the time. And then we can determine the crystal structure using a uh, single crystal diffraction methods, right? But uh, however, for MOF derived the carbon, right? The, you know, characterization method are relatively speaking limited. We could use gas absorption analysis, and then we could, you know, know the surface area and the bulk porosity of it, but uh, there's no info on material structure, right? Uh, for powder X-ray diffraction pattern, right? They have this pattern there, right? It's the average structure of a metal oxide phase, right? And then even you, you do a real world refinement over there, right? And then it's just not of this, uh, 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 components out there, they, they may be diffraction silent, right? You don't see them, you know, showing in the uh, XRD pattern, right? So the, also it's an average structure, limited info on, on carbon frameworks, for example. And also for the SEM picture, you see the bulk structure and surface morphology, and like this, the surface uh, module, right? of unknown origin, maybe some salt, maybe some ligand out there, right? But no info on phase and atomic structure, right? And same way with the TEM, you can see the size and shape of the metal oxide phase over there, right? Three to five nanometer metal oxide domains, but no info on the atomic structure or on the carbon material out there. So, so that's uh, when we, you know, need a, in, in the structure analysis, right? We need uh, some, you know, methods that are more than the uh, original, you know, the powder X-ray diffraction uh, data. So as you can tell, this is a, a PXRD uh, pattern for a porous polymer, right? On the right hand side is for a crystalline morph. So uh, for the crystalline ones, we have so many peaks out there, right? So it's easy for you to do a least a square kind of feed and then overall you can refine the structure there, right? But then on the other hand, we only see this uh, couple of humps over here, right? You can really use uh, Fourier transformation to determine the structure or use uh, this square refinement to refine the structure, right? It's just not enough data. So the questions to be addressed is that, uh, how does the structure of parent morph and carbonization condition impact the bulk properties, morphology and chemical structure of this morph derived carbons? So what are the local chemical environments in morph derived carbons regarding both the metal oxide phase and the carbon framework? So the experimental approach is to address those questions, right? Is that uh, we synthesize uh, various morph derived carbons and changing, right? Varying the parent morph, calcination, temperature, and, and gas environment. For example, maybe under nitrogen, under a D2O, right? Or under some other atmosphere. And uh, also uh, use, uh, BET powder X-ray microscopy to characterize the bulk properties and morphology. And then we use neutron diffraction total scattering to examine atomic structures in various phases, which is uh, the main theme of today's uh, symposium, right? So how can we get similar information from a, a amorphous materials as we get from a crystalline material? So that's the important question to answer, right? So, uh, uh, so assessing the atomic to nanoscale info through uh, total scattering, right? First, we need to kind of look at the uh, scattering that we're familiar with, right? Which is this uh, Bragg scattering. It's here, we see this uh, very sharp peaks out there, right? Uh, the information about the average structure, right? Because overall, it's a lattice, right? Uh, dif 
diffracts, and then overall, you have this average structure, for example, uh, average positions of the add-on, displacement parameters, they are also average, right, and the occupancies. Some of them maybe have occupancy, right, but that's that they have, well, the occupancy has to be refined, right? So, uh, and then there's this uh, new type of uh, scattering we never even need to consider, right? When we are, have this uh, Bragg scattering for the highly questioning material, it's there, but we don't need to actually consider that, right? But however, uh, when you uh, you have an amorphous material, right? Or near amorphous material, so uh, you have this advantage, right? Using neutron over X-ray scattering, you have higher scattering for carbon because you have a morph-derived carbon material, right? And better, better resolution for nearest neighbor elements. And then the, uh, you know, scattering components, uh, we have this periodic part, which is the Bragg scattering, and the non-periodic part, right? Which is the bottom one, the diffuse scattering, normally with no intensity, but uh, here actually it plays a very significant role before you know later on we can see for the data fading. Okay. Uh so uh how how should we do this, right? And let's uh use uh, some of these uh, examples we have, right? So uh, uh first uh again I'm preaching to the choir here, uh talk a little bit about uh, the pair distribution function. So, uh, uh, so the pair distribution function analysis, right, is the Fourier transform of scattering data from reciprocal space to real space. And then it uh, outputs an intensity graph of a varying interatomic distances or PDF peaks, right? So here's the interatomic distances, right? So here's the intensity. So, uh, for example, this uh, blue ones is from a chemical short range order, right? And, and then the, it's a, let's say it's a model to fade this, right? And then this is the difference, uh, remain. So to kind of a, the smaller this difference, right? The better the fade out there, right? So the structure determination from the raw PDF data, uh, normally, uh, it's, it's difficult to kind of solve an unknown structure there. It, it's possible, but uh, it's not that, that, that common. Normally, it's a very raw data to a known structure, right? And also, uh, for example, we, we know there's a zirconia, right? We're, we'll talk about cubic phase, and then we can fit that uh, you know, pretty well, right? Uh, also, uh, there are variable structural parameters, right? Some of those are similar to uh, like uh, X-ray diffraction or crystallography, right? So order the bound length shifts in in the peak locations, right? The occupancy, right? It actually changes the peak intensity and also the size of the domain. For example, uh, some of those may be 10 angstrom, some of those may be seven angstrom, and, the, and then, uh, it actually shows in the gradual peak uh, dampening. So we'll, we'll see that in some examples later on. So when we look at the, uh, when we evaluate the local uh, carbon structures uh, in morph derived carbons, right? It consists of two individual components with different structural property. One is the crystalline metal oxide domains, right? That one is very straightforward. And then it's the, amorphous graffiti carbon scaffolds, right? We need to uh, evaluate both. Uh, the well evaluation of the metal oxide structure is relatively easy, right? But uh, there have been few attempts to determine the structure of the carbon, particularly how it relates to morph derived carbon formation. So the simple question is that uh, what factors affect the size and the phase of the morph derived carbon scaffolds. Can new, neutron total scattering provide unique insights regarding the structure? Okay, so this is a 
the question to answer. So then we set up a few experiments. Those are three different maths, right? Uh, PCN 250, right? It's an IM off with this linker, right? So here's the surface area for that. And then we have zinc come off 74, right? With this uh, DOBDC ligand, right? And then the overall structure and surface area, UIO 66 with this zirconium, this is class of BDC linker. Structures like this and the surface area, right? When, and then we set up the carbonization temperature from 500, 600 to 700. And then under different environments like air, nitrogen, 2% of D2O in nitrogen, helium, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, right? 5% in nitrogen. So once we set up all this experiment, we perform uh, the calcination and then collect the PDF data, right? Huge one PDF data. So uh, the rate of our uh, refinement fade to the crystal structure, right? Refine individual structural parameters like this iron oxide, right? Uh, including the crystallographic parameters like cell parameters and uh, also uh, the domain size, whether it's a small chunk or a big area, right? And then say those, uh, uh, these step ones count for the metal oxide, right? So here's iron oxide. And uh, sometimes if you have to add multiple phases, right? For example, zirconia, you add a cubic, tetragonal and the malacanonic, right? Uh, and, and then analyze features in a different curve to determine the carbon phase. So here is the carbon phase, right? The green curve here is the graphite, right? And this is typical for graphite, right? Depending on the domain size, you may see more features here, right? And, and then fitting the carbon content. So how do you do that, right? So this peaks at uh, 1.4 and 2.4 uh, enstroms is uh, indicative of the sp2 graphitic atomic distances, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, atomic skills only, right, accounts for lack of diffraction peaks, right, for the graph graphitic uh, kind of structure there, right. And then there's uh, other residual features as well, such as uh, the minor contribution from residual CH bonds, right. So uh, this we didn't uh, put it here, but it's very minor. And then the minor magnetic scattering from iron. So this one is the orange curve there, right? And then when you add everything together, and then you can actually get this difference map out there. So let me see this. Uh, uh, okay, it's a chat in the... Okay, let me accelerate so I can finish on high. And it's frozen there. Okay, so uh, when uh, the, the local structure right is not captured in diffraction data uh, due to it being an average uh, over all size, for example, this represents the local structure, right? But it's an average structure when you have this uh, PDF analysis, right? So the PDF data is a collection of all real space distances, right? Often finding no symmetry structures at the local scale. Uh, as you can tell from here, so on the left hand side, it's the 500 degrees Celsius under air for the cal cosine, right? And then D2O, uh, 500 degrees Celsius. And then see this, the green is against the uh, uh, graphite or graphitic carbon, right? And then those are the uh, different phases, right? Of the zirconia, right? The uh, tetragonal, cubic, and monoclinic. And after this refinement, right? So for example, in air, right? The phases, right? It's uh, this one dominate, right? This one is uh, the tetragonal zirconia, right? And then on this side, right? When you have this uh, D2O 500 degrees Celsius, you do see some other phases as well, right? Uh, you, uh, and uh, 
So overall, right? Overall, you 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 can fit this data pretty well. And then we can analyze the graffiti column on uh, uh, the column faces, right? So uh, for example, uh, if here we, we kind of fit the data there, right? Uh, it's linear fit for cubic, it's the red, right? And then for more comedic phase and then for the triangular phase. So the overall results is that uh, uh, increase the carbon content, right? So it's increased the carbon content result in cubic phase actually increases, right? The red phase there, right? And then molecular clinic phase also increases this uh, blue phase, uh, blue trace, right? The triangular, the triangular phase actually decreases the green one over there. So uh, it actually is this confinement, right? Of the zirconium cluster in the carbon matrix. It reduces the metal oxide rearrangement. So for example, this one has very high symmetry, right? Is the cubic symmetry for the cluster itself. If it's confined in the carbon matrix, right? So you may end up a, as a cubic phase, right? And it maintain the high symmetry of a, the starting cluster there. So uh, uh, when we analyze this, the PCN250 based uh, morph derived for the carbon, right? And then we analyze this data. So uh, uh, the the higher relative intensity at around the, this R value, right, is a 1.4 angstrom. Uh, so uh, that means the higher proportion of larger domains. So uh, and normally the larger domain would have uh, this peaks are uh, higher, right, in this region. There. Also, the graphite domain size is larger in the nitrogen. So this this one is the blue one, right? Uh, calcined, then the D2O calcined, right? So uh, which is the red trace over there, right? Uh, it's actually a slight difference there, right? So you can see the distance from there, right? So find the last peak there, right? And, and then noticeable uh, difference curve indicates that a uh, greater relative water in, in nitrogen versus uh, D2O calcine samples consistent with the higher surface area of the starting morph, right? The carbon phase watering in uh, the column of 70, MOF 74 based uh, MOF derived carbons. So as you can tell from this data, right? Uh, as you go from 500, 600, and 700 degrees, right? So this oxide uh, domain and this other the kinetic domain and differences, right? Those are relatively speaking constant, but however, the domain size for the graffiti carbon goes from seven to 10 to 11, right? So noticeable increase in graffiti domain size with the increased carbonization uh, temperature. So the uh, also uh, the carbon phase watering, as you can tell from here, this is a zinc morph 74, right? And then we did this in D2O at a different temperature and then nitrogen in different temperature. So now this, we actually shown the data and nitrogen calcinated, right? As you can tell, when you go from low temperature to high temperature, right? So the, the domain size becomes uh, larger and larger, right? And also uh, uh, the uh, carbon domain size versus uh, calcination temperature and surface area, right? There's a kind of a correlation here, this temperature, the increase, the larger the domain size we've already talked about. And also there's a rough kind of correlation as the surface area increases, right? The carbon domain size increases as well. So a, a moderate correlation, right? The current key learnings from here, you know, is that, uh, the general ob observation, I think uh, the lower surface area observed for UIL 66 based uh, uh, MOF derived carbon, right? Uh, also the lower surface area observed in D2 and cal uh, CO2 cal calcine the MOF derived carbon and other gas environments, particularly at the higher temperatures, the correlation between surface area and the carbon content from strong to weak, right? PCN250, 
the better than zinc more for 74 right in terms of surface area right? larger than you know 66 the rationale to explain this right is that a uh, reduced connectivity for you are 66 right this can reduce the connectivity there right also the ignition itself is smaller right less interactions right despite higher zinc complexity binding ability right because it's less interactions out there in the middle there right and uh, also possibly reduce the kinetic stability of the model as well so competitive metal binding with d2 and co2 could net to the uh, increased probability of the pre carbonization structural collapse for example hydrolysis right uh, or decarbonization right so uh was stronger effect in moth derived carbons with the reduced connectivity, like uh, for example, UIL 66. So, uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, our collaborator, especially Dr. Uh, uh, Matthew Ryder and Dr. Catherine Page, Professor Catherine Page, right? Uh, so, uh, I think uh, Matthew essentially directed uh, both uh, Greg Day and uh, Hannah Drake. So uh, both uh, with uh, DOE uh, uh, fellowship. So uh, Greg is now in uh, Haley Burton and Drake is now in uh, uh, 3M and, and all the other so group members. He, he has a graduation party in uh, 2022 summer. This is Greg. So this is uh, Hannah. Yeah. So, and, and then uh, the uh, Nomad Beam Line uh, or NL. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joe. So we have the Q&A window open. If any of the audience members have questions, feel free to type them in the box now. Um, I'll ask a quick question if we don't have any others from the from the panelists. Wonder, um, see. Oh wait, we, we have one already. Let's let's go ahead and do this so we make sure that we get all the audience questions in case we have them. And since this is going to be recorded, I'll just I'll read the QA questions out since I don't think that will make it into the recording. Uh, so C Hai Yang says, is it possible to gain structural information on the active sites for either absorption or catalyst uh, or catalysis of these MOF derived carbon materials? from the neutron PDF analysis? So uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, when you have the MOF derived carbon, let's see, when you have the active site being it a open metal site, or for example, a pocket where you have this nitrogen that can bind uh, the active site over there, right? So. Uh, I think the answer is that uh, since it's an average structure there, right, it's actually quite difficult to get very accurate information there. But then on the other hand, if, for example, you have an open metal site, if you add, uh, you know, some, uh, let's see, gas that can interact with, uh, you know, the open metal site, right, and to make sort of a change the overall diffraction pattern there, right? And then, you know, the, the PDF data, you can make it a difference data, control everything else being the same, right? You may be able to tell, but it's going to be, you know, very difficult, not a very sensitive method out there. But maybe, you know, later on, Craig will talk about uh, the elastic neutron scattering and other stuff, right? They may give you some more you know, accurate information about the active site. I think it's a great question. So it's and another the second question. Let's see from Cheng Li and Nomad. He says, could you comment if there's additional information that could be gained if total scattering experiments are conducted in situ with gas, which I think you, you kind of touched on, but I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, if you could, uh, actually do this in situ experiment, right? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, still you, you do have this advantage of, uh, you know, getting the difference map out. But then on the other hand, since it's the average method, and also it's a slow method, relatively speaking, right? So for diffraction method, right? So uh, 
you are not going to be able to get a you know kinetic data or dynamic uh, data there, right? So maybe using other methods, you would uh, you know get more information on that. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll, let's do one more question, and then we'll um, we'll move on to the next speaker. But still, if you have questions, keep throwing them in the Q and A, and we can we can keep answering them uh, like uh, via text. So the last question is from Yahua Lu. Says, do you have a wish list about the experiment or sample and sample environment improvements for MOF studies with neutrons? Yeah, definitely this. Uh... Uh, in situ capability would it definitely help us uh, a lot, actually, especially we go into, uh, you know, kinetic uh, or, or sometimes trying to figure out, uh, you know, the activation barrier for catalysis and stuff like that. And also, if, uh, you know, for example, if uh, this uh, instrument is, is coupled with some other method, right, for example, let's see, surface enhanced Raman, or like, for example, you know, to monitor the spin change or the magnetic property change at the same time while you have this neutron diffraction data. That way you can sort of uh, corroborate, the data would corroborate with each other in situ, right? So uh, real time data that uh, corroborate with each other, that would be very, very powerful. Would that uh, answer the question? I think that, yeah, I think that's a good, that's a great segue also into the, the following talks that we have. And so, um, yeah, if you have more questions, drop them in the Q&A. And, and otherwise, thanks a lot, Joe. And we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Craig Brown. Craig, if you want to, we'll switch this screen share. Let me stop share right away. Okay. Got it. So Craig Brown is a fellow at NIST, where he leads the team for structure and dynamics of materials doing diffraction and spectroscopy. And uh, let's just let you get right to it, Craig, take it away. Right, thanks for that. Slide. Is everything good? Yeah. See the screen and everything. So my, my plan today is to give you a little bit of the lessons that I've learned over about 20 years of doing neutron scattering on porous materials really related to to MOFs in the past 17 years or so but we started a little earlier than that in kind of a kludgy way that I'll show and uh, along the way I'll show you some of the technological improvements that have really helped accelerate the kind of science that we've been doing and probably can excel can accelerate our nascent uh, scientists who want to get involved in these fields and then I'll have a couple of comments at the end about what I think could be important for the future in neutron scattering. So NIST itself, everybody knows it. it if you've ever done a standard reference material calibration of your X-ray instrument, we've got standard reference peanut butter. It's about uh, $800 a jar, but it's just regular peanut butter from the shelf. The reason why it's so expensive is because of all this uh, scientists time that's gone into um, measuring all the different properties of that material. But you got to be, uh, a, you know, a little careful about what you get from those shelves. And spam is one of them, and uh, vitamins as well. Uh, NIST has uh, a whole suite of neutron capabilities. It's not operating at the moment uh, due to an unforeseen fuel element issue, but we expect to be back early next year in operations, and hopefully we can get users back in the building. So here's where the timeline starts. I came to NIST in '99. And almost immediately, I started working on hydrogen in nanotubes, which was really hot then because there were some papers saying that you could get 14 weight percent hydrogen storage in nanotubes. And there was one paper that uh, had alkali intercalated nanotubes saying that you could get 40 weight percent. And so we worked with that first group saying 14 weight percent uh, was available. And the, the work we were doing and the work that was subsequent done by that team um, found out that partly they had metal hydrides formed in their systems due to the sonication and cleaning process and uh, but we went ahead and did some uh, neutron scattering work before that here we're looking at the rotational transitions of normal hydrogen absorbed on nanotube surfaces not inside the bundles because they weren't open and it's kind of broad and messy and 
but that that was pretty good for us at the the time. Uh, the way we did those experiments was really, I'd say, very limited. We only had a scroll pump. It was oil backed on that. We had a humongous pressure gauge that could go to about a, a thousand bar, and uh, a welded manifold and copper and swage connections to most of the sample environment that would go inside of Chrysler. And this or this apparatus uh, existed before I came to NIST. And I was in the high bay prepping an experiment and the lead reactor engineer came up and he said, oh my God, what is this monster of equipment? And I said, I don't know, you guys uh, okayed it for safety. And it was at that point that we decided that this, this could probably be improved and we so, in future years, you'd see that we set about improving the capabilities that we had. It took a, quite a few years later with some work uh, with Timmy Ramirez, uh, who was at the time instrument scientist at Tosca at ISIS. And you could see that the resolution of uh, those same nanotubes could be improved for this rotational transition. Uh, we didn't know at at that time, uh, the origin of uh, those rotations, we suspected it could be just hydrogen manifold, the J equal one level splitting into two states uh, with MJ zero and MJ plus and minus one. So you always get it this constant ratio of two. That disagreed with some other things in the literature that showed even more complex uh, patterns. We did some work on boron uh, substituted arc produced nanotubes and laser produced nanotubes uh, with the young, young Liu. And that proved to me beyond a doubt that these splitting effects and the, the really big split, splitting effects that were in these uh, unpurified single wall nanotubes were probably uh, due to hydrogen interacting with a mass of defects in the arc versus the lasers where you can uh, have much more pristine systems. And this was borne out by some ESR work uh, uh, by some people in Texas, as I recall, and some other techniques that proved that basically arc produced nanotubes are very dirty, full of me um, encapsulated metals and defects on the tubes and the laser processes are much more pristine. And then it took us a few years before we got back to uh, looking at porous materials again. And that's where we started working on metal organic frameworks in about 2006. And so we'd upgraded the cryostats to closed cycle. Uh, we had sample cells that could go in the glove box for to ensure that the uh, the environment that the samples saw was pristine from synthesis to measurement. Uh, during this period, we'd worked with various groups uh, from across the country. Some of them worked with uh, this uh, top image here, which is a swage lock and they'd bring their gas loading apparatus and we'd spend days doing leak checks. And so this was really painful. And we decided to go the welded route uh, using the gaskets, the VCR gaskets that are at the bottom. And for the past 16 years or so, these have been extremely reliable and we can transport our uh, equipment to different facilities, including Oak Ridge, so that we can do these measurements and we don't have to worry about the leaks and uh, how much time we spend uh, leak checking the swage lock kind of systems. I mean, normally they're fine, but um, if they're not put together absolutely correctly the first time, then you you, you do end up with leaks. Uh, here's a, an example of a sample cell that's sitting on a, uh, a gas dosing stick that fits inside that cryostat over there. So you can see that we can do everything in situ. We take off that green knob completely. So everything's embedded within the cryostat and at temperature. This manifold is the simple thing that we uh, worked on after that first iteration. It has a number of different small volumes here that you could either use as expansion volumes or uh, select gases for your experiment. There's two gauges up on the top left, pressure relief valve, and then you can use a vacuum and also put a flexible metal hose to, to go to deliver to the sample. And the pressure gauges are easily controlled, very easy to write a driver in whatever language you want. This, this I wrote in Python so that you can plot the pressure function of time. Of course, that's not good enough. And then uh, Tani Yildirim and Wei Zhao decided that they were gonna build their own uh, home-built uh, Sieverts apparatus. 
This has got much more functionality and it can actually do accurate sieverts measurements as well from 30K up to uh, whatever temperature, maximum temperature of your cryostat could be. This is uh, this has been a workhorse in terms of lab-based utility, but we've also uh, remade one of these to have a computerized gas loading cart that's available at the facility. So I'm going to get through some of these, these papers that came up. Oh, uh, at the time, uh, probably for the crystallography, most of the data analysis happened within uh, GSAS and XGRI. XGRI was um, uh, a TCL program that sat on top of uh, GSAS, written by Brian Toby uh, many years ago. It's probably the highest cited paper in all of NIST the one that describes this use and it was super useful for us at the time and we get uh images that look like this from modeling uh the atomic positions and coordinates of atoms in the average crystal view and fitting that to powder diffraction data this is a uh, copper benzene tristetrazole system you can see that there's a central benzene ring surrounded in uh like 120 degree tristetrazole rings that bind to these metal ions with a central chloride ion. And these are partially sol solvated, uh, but you can easily find uh, D2 molecules uh, absorbed in those systems. And they, they, they look like a blob because they're quantum mechanically average. I'll show some INS data later that shows that they're quantum molecules. And so you shouldn't expect to see them as individual hydrogen atoms. You should expect them to see as some kind of uh, mass of uh, scattering density. The, the interesting thing about the entire series here is that despite some of them being more solvated than others, uh, like the manganese is more solvated than the copper and the iron is uh, not solvated at all, there's an increase in enthalpy for absorption for the hydrogen compared to a metal organic framework that doesn't have exposed metal sites. And uh, the increase in enthalpy for adsorption was seen as a mechanism to improve the uh, performance characteristics of a prospective hydrogen storage uh, medium towards room temperature. And so in the back of our minds, this was all, you know, how do we characterize materials that have high delta H's and how do we, um, how do we improve the material synthesis to get towards a room temperature uh, hydrogen storage material? And in principle, the theoretical nut value is somewhere between 15 and 25 kilojoules per mole. And you can see that we're a long way away from that at the beginning of this research. And we've got an example coming up. Oh, oh it took a while for me to get back into this. Uh, one interesting example that um, shows the flexibility in metal organic frameworks was uh, some work that Yun did, Yun Liu. And it's on this class of um, gate opening uh, flexible uh, mill series uh, materials, mill 53 in particular. And it was already shown in the literature that you can add solvents like CO2 and water and you can induce uh, an opening or closing depending on what's in or out of the pool. But Jan was trying to do some hydrogen storage work on this and he couldn't get any uh, really consistent results. It took him a while but he realized that, that there was a temperature dependent hysteresis to this work. So you heat it up to hundred degrees and the, the unit cell opens, you cool it down below 200 K and it slowly closes again. And it almost is completely closed at 77 K and you re recycle that and it starts opening again at 300 K. So we could do the, the entire crystallography around that hysteresis loop, but you can also do uh in elastic neutron scattering and, and look at the phonons of the the benzene linkers as they're in it's very different between the open state and the closed state as they're interacting with each other and that's what maybe i can get a, a mouse or something no i can't see where my cursor is so i can't i can't do any clicking but the difference between the blue and the black curve show the difference between the the open phase and the closed phase and if you integrate those phonon areas you end up with the the picture at the bottom that illustrates uh what what we could determine from uh powdered diffraction uh 
I think in 2008 was like our opus on looking at hydrogen and its interaction with open metal sites with uh, the crystallography previously with uh, uh, Vanessa Peterson and Yang Liu, where we located hydrogen at uh, the copper paddle wheel inside uh, the octahedral window and inside that octahedral pore. And you can see those three different hydrogen sites in, in this uh, molecular view. In terms of the INS, clearly we can measure the, the neat material and look at all the vibration interactions. It's pretty much just like a, a selection rule, less optical uh, scattering technique like infrared or Raman, we see everything. Uh, the good thing about uh, neutrons is that it's completely easy to, to get a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between a quantum mechanic calculation and that data. So you can see here that is a really good agreement on the framework. We can also look at the hydrogen in those systems, and it took us a while to, to, to make a system that could generate para hydrogen instead of normal hydrogen, because the ortho and para hydrogen are fixed at a 25 to 75% ratio at room temperature, at all temperatures, if they don't have a catalyst to co interconvert. So we use a catalyst to, to generate uh, para hydrogen, which is in the rotational ground state, the J equals zero state, add it to the metal organic framework, and that allows us to, to probe J equals zero to all the sublevels above that. Uh, the blue curve at the bottom shows what we measure with less than one hydrogen on the metal center, and the green, it, there's more than one hydrogen on the metal. So we're occupying at least two sites, even if there's a distribution between uh, the different enthalpies for the different sites. If we focus on the the, the blue para hydrogen, if you expect a J equals zero to J equals one transition, if it's just, uh, if it's ideal, then that energy is about 14.7 MeV, right? Clearly it's, it's not that. If the hydrogen's interacting with a the surface, then that J equals one level splits into one, into two or three different manifolds. And clearly there's more than three transitions here. And so the, the goal of this paper was to try and understand why that's happening. Uh, we could also get the Q dependence of those transitions uh, using a, a cold time of flight triple axis. And here we're showing uh, the integrated intensities of those individual peaks that are related to the different uh, manifold transitions. And what we learned from this is that you can describe the Debye-Waller factor, essentially how free the hydrogen molecule is uh, compared to bulk hydrogen, and it's really tightly bound. It's it's limited in in terms of it, the space uh, volume that it can um, it can feel while it's attached to that metal center. Uh, the other thing is that we don't have to invoke a hydrogen hydrogen elongation to generate these um, to understand the Q dependence of those in, uh, peaks. Tani Yildirim did some nice work looking at the total potential of a hydrogen molecule that's attached to this cluster in three-dimensional space. Uh, the volume there is on the top right. And if you solve that uh, use for the Schrodinger equation, the rotational Schrodinger equation, it gives you the transitions that you'd expect. And so we can assign each of these uh, transitions, if you just compare to the blue again, that we've got rotation and rotation translation uh, coupling. But it doesn't agree very well with what you'd expect for a simple one-dimensional or two-dimensional um, potential system that's often used in the, li the literature. And we kept going. And this is where uh, life started getting a little tricky for doing uh, measurements. When we were doing the gas dosing of hydrogen in the top loading system, we never used to condense any gases on those lines. But at this point, we were doing different types of gases, CO2, oxygen. And after a couple of experiments that were extremely difficult and uh, not terribly quantitative, because we'd had a partitioning of the gas being absorbed into the metal organic framework and some of it sticking in the line, even when we had heaters, uh, we came up with another method where uh, we could take this entire apparatus here, which is essentially just a collar with a, a space, a copper spacer for the lid, so that uh, it doesn't change the, uh, the center of the sample with respect to the neutron beam height. And we could put this in the glove box and uh, load the sample and bring it out. There's a, 
there's a, a tiny little path length between the cold finger of the cryostat head that uh, sits above the copper block and the pass through for the, the gas line. Uh, you can insulate that really simply with just a little bit of uh, Teflon or uh, PTFE or plastic if it physically touches. But we've had no problems doing gas dosing for even the most condensable gases using this system. And so typically, well, we don't use the top loading system anymore. We, we always use this one. Here it is at work. Uh, it's got that same gas cart from uh, half a decade ago. And... Uh, a displex and let's see and here's the computer control system that you could use if you wanted to <clears throat> we find that at nist measurement times are usually six to eight hours and the postdocs are usually juggling multiple experiments at the same time on the same instrument so they take off one displex uh, dose it with a different gas or a different concentration of gas and while that's equilibrating they put on a sample that they've already freshly prepared or um, conditioned how they want. And so it's a couple of days of um, exhaustion, and uh, but it optimizes beam time because you don't have to wait for the cryostat to warm up to use the computer control system to cool it back down again. And it, I think you'll see that uh, we've got a lot of papers due to the really high um, usage that we've had of the neutron beam time that we've been able to secure at NIST. Moving on to uh, something from last decade, which is an odd thing to say. Uh, in 2011, uh, I went to Australia for four months. This was a fantastic experience. They got great instruments. Uh, we ended up with about five papers over that time. The first one uh, was uh, this paper looking at different types of oxygen in a, an iron metal organic framework where the iron uh, can be in two different states. If you put the oxygen in at low temperatures, you end up with uh, physical adsorption, typically. And that's consistent with MOS power, where you end up with a superoxide. As you heat it up, however, then it turns into a, a peroxide. And you, you can see that the, uh, the oxygen's really extended in this system. And there's 50% uh, of the iron sites would be occupied by this uh, peroxo species. And the binding of the nitrogen is completely different. And so there's some potential for these type of uh, interactions where you've got a high enthalpic uh, oxygen in interaction. Hopefully it would be reversible, not like in this case, and a weaker interacting nitrogen so that you could get uh, much more energy efficient O2 and N2 separations. Because right now it's done under uh, distillation conditions at cryogenic temperatures. and it's about 95% of the total energy used in air separations is separating oxygen and nitrogen. And uh, this was a little strange for us at the time because uh, it's kind of a, it really is a co cooperative absorption. When the, the oxygen's in one unit cell, you can see on the right hand side, these are the, the, the same Bragg peaks uh, for the entire system. But one particle is pulling in oxygen and there's a cooperative absorption of oxygen in that one particle. And it's com completely reversible in this system. Uh, that was pretty neat. Uh, both Wendy Queen and Matt Hudson, who were postdocs at the time, came out to do some experiments and uh, got some papers. Uh, possibly the most important one that we got was separation of uh, different hydrocarbons and understanding the interaction potential between those hydrocarbons and different metals. Uh, this had, some of these interactions had never been characterized before, and this was a, a really nice paper in science. Possibly, uh, this is going to embarrass Matt, but you can see how much effort it took us to, to be able to make everything work here. We've got different temperature controllers for the gas line and the heater and all the rest of it. Uh, but in Australia, you got to love your shellfish, and Matt's clearly not a, not a fan. You can laugh with the mics muted if you want to. Uh, but we got some really nice uh, results out of that. Uh, Matt was looking at CO2 absorption in some zeolites. And because of the quadrupolar interaction between the uh, dipolar CO2 and this eight-membered ring in the Chabazite SSZ13 zeolite, there's a really strong interaction uh, for CO2 within that ring for low aluminum content uh, silicates. If you go to really high aluminum silicon contents, 
and especially the potassium uh, kind, there was some work done by Paul Webley uh, in Australia where you you can get es essentially a gate blocking mechanism because the cations start populating those eight membered ring sites and it stops the CO2 being able to diffuse into them. So uh, zeolites have a, a different knob to turn compared to uh, metal organic frameworks. There's very little uh, that you can do in terms of the morphology in one class of zeolites, but you can change the cations and you can change the density of the al aluminum substitution, uh, which changes the cation concentration as well. And so there's a lot there's a lot of parameterization that one could uh, study in those materials. And of course, there's a lot of them are catalytic uh, in certain conditions as well. Let's move on a bit quicker. I mean, one, one of the unique things about uh, doing uh, neutron diffraction compared to x-rays is that you have if you have a molecule like um, N2O or CO, which are really close to the periodic table and, and um, in the first row, then it can be very difficult for x-rays to, to be able to distinguish these uh, very well, but it's completely trivial with neutron. And Matt Hudson did this work with Eric Block uh, where he... There's a high spin state for each of these uh, metals if they're in the transition metal state. And so you can get reversible adsorption and desorption of the carbon monoxide complex, which is normally not what happens. Usually it induces the, the low spin transition and there's a really strong binding and uh, back bonding from the transition metal to the carbonyl complex and that becomes irreversible. So these metal organic frameworks showed uh, some really unique properties. And again, some of these systems had never been measured uh, the, the CO2 interaction with any some of these metals had never been uh, observed before. The You can characterize the degree of uh, backbonding and uh, orbital overlap by uh, how close the CO2 molecule is getting towards the transition metal and also how far away from 180 degrees it is. The same uh, concept applies in this case where we were absorbing, where Diane was absorbing N to O into uh, the same series of metal organic frameworks uh, and using the weak oxidative uh, properties of N to O to uh, convert ethane into ethanol. And uh, Wendy did some work trying to understand the differences between the different adsorption states. And you actually get both types of binding mechanisms inside this metal organic framework. It's only the O-bound one that seems to be um, functional, however. So Eric did some nice work looking at metal organic frameworks in HCUST uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Bess, a theorist who was working with Martin Head Gordon and the people out at uh, Berkeley. Uh, they computed that uh, the diffraction uh, where the, the, the methane is with, within those octahedral cubes uh, away from the transition metals, those are the most stable adsorption sites. And it's really the, the interaction of uh, different uh, methanes across the pore between the different paddle wheels and the copper interaction that sums up to get a, 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 a almost 15 kilojoules per mole uh, enthalpy for interaction. Uh, the methane really doesn't like the metal center in that case. I guess it's a bit too bulky uh, to interact just on its own. And then uh, this is work that uh, led will lead into something in uh, just a moment. And Jared Mason, uh, making flexible metal organic frameworks that respond in a wise fashion instead of the type one type isotherms. So you could load methane in the system uh, to 60 bars and by five bars, you get all of the methane back out as it opens and closes. And we were looking at the, uh, the structure of this material. The useful thing here is that there's an automatic uh, enthalpic balance uh, as you get a strong interaction initially with the framework because it takes energy to open, there's a drop in the differential enthalpy as you're uh, expanding this framework. And so it's beneficial in terms of uh, heat management for these systems. Uh, that really tied into some of the work that uh, Mercedes did in her PhD 
where she optimized the transition temperatures for those uh, materials and the opening pressure behavior by substituting different uh, atoms on, on the benzyl, central benzene ring. Oh, and then uh, finally, I, this, this was pretty cool work that I did with Tomcha Ronchevsky, who's at uh, Southern Methodist University, uh, where for the first time in a metal organic framework, we crystallographically shown that you can absorb two different methods Two different gas species on the transition metal and this won an award for from the doe and then it was a, about this time in uh, my career that ben trump came to work with us and he revolutionized essentially how we were doing uh, powder diffraction analysis because i was always too cheap to buy topaz and he liked it and uh it's changed how we do everything within the group we have several licenses and it's ex it it turns out that uh, the flexibility of having the our scripting language means that we can do a, a whole ton of work really quickly and now i'm almost running out of time so i'm going to be very quick on the next things i'm not going to talk about hydrogen quasi-elastic scattering or ins anymore but uh just to summarize all that hydrogen work uh Hydrogen absorbed in these metal organic frameworks results in hydrogen interatomic distances that are much more compressed and even compared to solid hydrogen at uh, 20 Kelvin or below. And so it's 77 Kelvin, 78 bar. This is uh, super dense hydrogen. We've looked at the different uh, scattering at higher temperatures and the dynamics. One thing that uh, I, I was always nervous to do was to look at real hydrogen inside those systems we we did that and proved that we could do it we looked at some uh polyhedral cages like these and here's an example of a script in topaz that allowed ben to solve the solvated structure and slightly disordered structure here you can see it's a lot of work but we wouldn't have been able to do that if if it wasn't for those capabilities and, and ben's uh, ability and moving quickly on here, I'm just getting to the new postdocs, uh, Ryan Klein and uh, Hayden Evans and the work that they've been doing. Hayden's been looking at uh, some, oh, we of course, everything's shrunk now. So this is our gas manifold, which is about uh, 12 inches in size. And th that's all we need to do gas absorption measurements on, you know, multi hundred milligram uh, quantities of MOFs. But this is the work that Hayden's been doing, where, as I said previously, we were trying to optimize that enthalpy for absorption for hydrogen, trying to get it in that perfect window. He definitely uh, found a nice system here, did all the hobby. Uh, that's lovely stuff. He's coming up in just a minute. I don't want to take his thunder away. But there are lots of opportunities for just studying plain metal organic frameworks in their average structure. And here's an example that we haven't published yet, and that's looking at competitive absorption. Of course, it can't be competitive absorption for molecules that give you the same molecular structure uh, uh, through the diffraction process. But here we have uh, oxygen and nitrogen binding in a metal organic framework, and they're, they're slightly different. And so you can be quantitative. Uh, of course, there's a difficulty going away from the 90k measurements here towards room temperature where things become more disordered and then then it might become impractical i'm not sure if uh, we could do pair distribution analysis on those um, uh, it might be too transient for the molecules to be absorbed or localized uh, by some analysis but clearly i think uh joe pointed it out that uh there's an interest in looking at more complicated things uh ha indicated that catalysis is big there's been a lot of work on vision and try to identify uh, uh catalytic species um and coupling the capabilities of quantum calculations with the uh, the measurements that they can make I and mean, clearly we need multiple techniques to be able to answer those kind of um questions uh and i'm looking forward to see how neutron scattering sample environment uh, and computation interface to, to allow new science to be done. So let me stop sharing my screen and then we can chat. Great, thank you, Craig. 
So while we wait for a couple of questions to pop up, I, one thing that strikes me is, you know, how much work goes on behind the scenes to set everything up, right? These different iterations of your gas loading cells. And I assume that one of the great things about this is that users can take advantage of all this work that you've done, right? So if someone is seeing this and thinking, wow, what an amazing setup they've built here, you know, what is the best way to to get involved and, and get your attention and get get in that uh, that workflow. Well, we're happy to talk to people at any stage in the 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 science pipeline process that they want to be at, whether it's trying to understand you know what experiments are best, pointing them in the right direction, whether it's X-rays or neutrons or what capabilities we have at NIST or what's available in this country and outside. Uh, we've we also have. Um, you know, we've had a good uh, relationship with the guys on Vision, Timmy Ramirez and uh, YQ have been fantastic. And they have, Oak Ridge has a different um, philosophy on sample environments and users than we do at NIST. In both places, there's a lot of self-driven development because of the instrument scientists. But if there's, there's clearly some gaps at Oak Ridge that we're trying to help bridge because uh, I, I guess this kind of science hasn't been very prevalent down at Oak Ridge, and we've had some troubles doing experiments on non-vision instruments, and we're trying to get things done. They're making some good progress on power gen. You could do some things on, um, on Nomad. When you get down to the reactor and HP2A, it, if you're not doing hydrogen, it, becomes very difficult. It's like going back 10 years for us. And so we've been working with uh, Gary Lynn to try and accelerate getting things in place. So I, I think if you're a user, you could talk to someone at Oak Ridge or someone at NIST, whichever place you want to go and try and do measurements. You'll get some response, but make sure that they, someone's going to be responsive. Okay. Hold their feet to the fire, please. It, it, if it's us, do it. Do it as well. We are we are a resource for for the community. We sh we should respond. Craig, uh, thanks for a great presentation. As the one on the of the panelists, uh, let me benefit and ask you a question, which is like a ball from the blue. I'm not in a, in a field, but I'm, I'm listening to these uh, talks uh, where you you know look for the structures of immensely complex materials. Um, I was wondering, um, is there a uh, I mean, is, is it possible to somehow use um, the, uh, you know, isotope substitution of the type, you know, like uh, enriching by nitrogen 15, uh, if you have a nitrogen containing material, which has like twice smaller coherent cross section, uh, and, and sort of, uh, again, this a question that, that substitution or something, or maybe so it doesn't matter. The, the crystallography usually, uh, the, the crystalline nature is usually sufficient that even though the background's a little bit worse, it doesn't really change the quality of uh, the fits. And that's one of the reasons why I was always nervous to put H2 gas in large quantities inside one of these materials. And it, it, it took me quite a while to be brave enough to almost think I was wasting beam time to try it. It works completely fine. I think uh, Cheng Li's done some measurements on uh, power gen as well, and those results are very positive. Okay, we we do have one comment in the in the chat from Cheng Li saying that uh, power gen is developing gas dosing setup, and uh, any interested user should should send the power gen team a uh, message. And then we have another question from Simon Vornhold. Uh, great talk, Craig. I was wondering if you have a setup for controlling the relative humidity of your gas loading apparatus? And if so, how do you standardize it? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, this, this is something that's becoming um, much more important for us as we're moving into in, uh, some research that uh, NIST is um, interested in on carbon capture. So we do have some humidity uh, generating and controlling devices primarily early for reflectivity studies, and we haven't used them on diffraction or INS quens type material uh, instruments yet. Uh, this is something that isn't going to go away, and we are going to try and improve our capabilities for sure. Okay. 
And then uh, Matthew Ryder says, uh, could you please comment on where you see neutrons playing a unique role in direct air capture research, uh, where very low gas concentrations make X-ray techniques um, more accessible? Yeah, it's true. If, if you, you might have low concentrations in the air, and it might take a while for the kinetics or thermodynamics of the material to absorb the CO2. But in our experience, 400 ppm concentrations in some amine supported materials and metal organic frameworks are probably at the concentrations we can de uh, detect them with neutrons. Okay, and then last question before we have to move on. Uh, CI says, can you please comment on the development or studies of diffusion of gas molecules in MOFs? Yeah, I was a bit quick on uh, just commenting about the simple hydrogen diffusion in those metal organic frameworks. There's, it, it's something that's been going on for a long time, looking at hydrogen, methane, all, benzene, all, all kinds of short chain alkane molecules. There's been some nice work um, uh, from, oh God, what's the French guy's name? In, uh, he was at the ILL for quite a lot. They did some work on putting linear alkanes in zeolites, and they got this super high diffusivities. They called it a blow dart effect as it moved between the different cages and the small windows to the different cages. Uh, Hervé Jovic. And there's, there is quite a bit of uh, hydrogen uh, diffusion work done on the mill systems, again, by people going to the ILL. I think it's just, there's there's a lot of things that could be done. It's just what's interesting and how much bandwidth people have and how much time there is. Um, I'd say industrially, there's a lot of interest in understanding those uh, thermodynamic parameters, diffusivities, self-diffusivities in particular, because neutrons are one of the ways that you can get them and it complements other thermodynamic te techniques. And so it can give you the, the full engineering picture of how you uh, understand the thermodynamics of a material that's operating in a plant. So I think it's important. Great. Great. Thanks, Greg. So we're going to move on to our next speaker is Mercedes Taylor. And so Mercedes is an assistant professor in the chemistry and biochemistry department at the University of Maryland. She's an expert in synthesis of materials, moths and coughs, <laughs> and other things. Take it away, Mercedes. All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, how can you can you see my slides? Looks great. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I'm happy to be here talking with you all, and I think my role is to sort of present maybe the the user the potential user perspective. I synthesize materials, and um, I'll talk to you about what we're interested in learning about them and what we're using them for. Um, so my research group at the University of Maryland is about one year old. We have three PhD students, a postdoc and an undergrad, um, and we've got a bunch of projects going on the synthesis of different types of crystalline and amorphous porous materials. Um, and the problems that we are trying to tackle with these materials are all kind of broadly related to sustainability. Um, things like water stress or ways to separate chemicals from each other more efficiently um, or uh, ways that we could store energy within a material. Um, for us, all of these diverse problems have in common a need for materials that would store guest molecules, um, easily transport these molecules into and out of a particle and select for certain guests, uh, even in the presence of a, of a broad mixture of molecules. Um, the guests that we are interested in capturing or transporting um, range from organic contaminants that are present in water, like these perfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. Um, these, these molecules, as you probably know, are used in things like firefighting foams or in Teflon coatings um, and are increasingly understood to be both toxic and ubiquitous in the environment. Um, coming at it from the other direction, there are also um, ions or molecules that we would like to capture because they're so valuable and useful. Um, these metal cations ranging from lithium to rare earth ions are necessary for green technologies and it would be really excellent to be able to selectively capture these ions from water sources 
like wastewater or even seawater. Um, and finally, we have a project going on on the capture of inorganic contaminants, um, such as arsenate from water sources. Um, we are synthesizing a range of different materials um, from these covalently linked porous organic polymers um, that are completely amorphous um, to covalent organic frameworks, which are also composed of organic building blocks, but are crystalline, um, to metal organic frameworks, which are composed of both inorganic and organic units, um, and are, they can be very highly crystalline. Um, so in contrast to this sort of, this is, this is a, perhaps very general, but the increase in crystallinity from porous polymers up to moss is contrasted with a, a decrease in hydrolytic stability. So we care a lot about um, that our materials being stable to water. We'd like to use them in applications uh, like water purification. So a metal organic framework, some moths are very stable, but um, the existence of these metal ligand bonds makes them more susceptible to hydrolysis, a water molecule getting in there to coordinate to the metal than something like a polyamide. Um, which is composed of just, uh, you know, covalent organic linkages. Um, so these are these are the traits that we balance in the synthesis of our materials, um, and of course the crystallinity, as has been referenced already. The more crystalline a material, the easier it is to understand what atoms are where, what functional groups are next to other functional groups, and as a synthetic chemist, we can use that knowledge to better design our materials towards a particular application. So in the world of porous polymers that are not crystalline, um, it sometimes feels like we're flying very blind and it would be better to understand more clearly the pore environment um, and the orientation of functional groups with respect to each other. On, on this slide, for example, is just a chem draw that I drew. Um, this is like the what I hypothesize the local environment of one of our porous polymers to be, but it isn't obviously solved, a soft crystal structure like the other structures shown on this slide. All right, so um, when I was still at Berkeley, I had the opportunity to collaborate with different teams of people who were making porous organic polymers. Both of the materials shown on this slide um, have this backbone that's composed of biphenyl units linked in these tetrahedral carbon nodes that lead to very high branching and high internal surface areas. Um, this backbone is called porous aromatic framework number one or path one and what we did was to functionalize path one with these different functional groups like an ether thioether chain or an n-methyl d-glucamine unit um, and these functional groups ended up uh, giving us materials that were highly selective either for ion, ions like iron or boron, um, both of which would be desirable to capture or detect in water sources. Um, and so while these projects were kind of slam dunks in terms of materials design, I had a front row seat to witnessing how labor intensive this type of synthesis can be. In particular, in discovering this ether thioether chain, the lead synthetic chemist on this project um, ended up making a lot of analogs where both of these heteroatoms were oxygen, um, truncating this chain. And each of these um, different analogs required so much um, synthetic effort that uh, one of the questions that I'm trying to answer with my own research group now is whether we could achieve um, excellent adsorption properties in a material in a more generalizable way. So one possible approach to this generality is to take a monomer that you're ultimately gonna build a material out of, interact it with your target adsorbate to form a mar uh, tar target monomer complex, and then um, polymerize these complexes by reacting them with each other to form some kind of organic or covalent bonding between the monomers. Then um, if you wash away the, the target ion, you could leave behind these templated binding sites that were preformed around your desired adsorbate um, and use your activated material to capture that adsorbate from water. Um, so we're trying to see if we can do this templating in porous materials while we retain that porosity that allows adsorbates to enter and leave the particle um, and see whether it results in um, higher capacities for these adsorbates. Uh, there are a lot of criteria that you would want to install all at once in such a material. Um, you need branching and rigidity in order to have this permanent porosity. Um, we obviously want there to be water stable bonds between these monomers. Um, we want to design a polymerization that will not disrupt the monomer target 
binding. Um, so for example, we were trying to stay away from metal catalyzed couplings or polymerizations because we don't want some metal catalyst to displace the, the target ion that we've so carefully put into this complex. Um, and finally, uh, we need the monomer to have functionality both to interact with the target and then to uh, bond to other monomers. So the molecule that we selected to accomplish all of these tasks was a um, tetrakis aminophenyl methane. So this central um, tetrahedral carbon accomplishes branching that's gonna lead to three dimensionality in the resulting polymer. Um, these phenyl rings are rigid and they're gonna help us establish rigidity. Um, the amino groups can both coordinate to a transition metal and also react with acyl chlorides or some kind of activated uh, carboxylate to form amide bonds. These amide bonds will be hydrolytically stable and themselves rigid. So we hypothesized that we would be able to get all of the, the properties that we wanted by building off of this tetra methane. The target ion that we selected in this study is a divalent cobalt, so cobalt-2. Um, this is kind of a representative two plus transition metal that could represent uh, any of many different divalent ions that you might ultimately care about capturing. But cobalt itself is a really important and valuable target because of its use in rechargeable batteries. So lithium ion batteries um, have led to a skyrocketing demand for cobalt that is going to continue to increase. All right, so we took this tetraamine and reacted it with a series of different um, acyl chlorides to yield a series of different cross-linked porous polymers. Um, this diacyl chloride, tri, or tetraacyl chloride. And so it yielded a series of insoluble organic materials. Um, this is, as I mentioned before, just a chem draw representation um, of what a hypothetical section of um, this, this particular polymer would look like. Um, we characterize these and show that they have an increasing porosity by BET um, based on the number, the degree of branching in that acyl chloride coupling partner. Um, and then we tested these materials, which are basically our controls. Like we haven't done any templating in these. These are just porous, porous um, organic polymers. We tested whether they would be able to capture cobalt ions from aqueous solution. And in fact, they're all kind of decent. Like in comparison to other materials that people are publishing on for cobalt capture, um, these uh, porous polymers performed okay at pulling cobalt out of water. The one that happened to have the highest cobalt adsorption capacity is the one shown in here in black. Um, you take a triacyl chloride and react it with this tetraamine and um, you obtain a material that is able to pull a decent amount of cobalt ions out of water. So this was the material that we went with to then try out that um, sort of ion templating strategy that I described before. So to template that polymer, um, we added a step at the beginning of the synthetic route in which we coordinated this amine to a cobalt-2 source. Um, by reacting it with cobalt dichloride, we obtained um, these crystallites. This is an SEM of, of the cobalt monomer complexes. And we characterized these complexes by PXRD and TGA in order to make sure that we understood um, that both cobalt and the amine were present and the correct ratio of these amino uh, monomers to cobalt ions so that we could then use the right amount of the subsequent acyl chloride coupling partner. Um, so then with these cobalt monomer complexes in hand, we continued down the synthetic route. Um, this is a representation of the cobalt monomer complex. Um, we combined it with, with this trimesoyl chloride molecule to get a cross-linked insoluble network. Um, we use dilute acid to wash away the cobalt ions and leave behind an activated polymer. Um, so then this polymer is what we wanted to test for its cobalt adsorption capacity. And this is kind of the banner result of the project. Um, our cobalt templated polymer takes up a really significantly greater amount of cobalt ions from aqueous solution compared to any of those non-templated polymers that I described earlier. Um, and as a synthetic chemist, the, the reason that I think this is a powerful result is that we haven't done any um, 
custom monomer synthesis. We weren't being careful to install certain um, cobalt binding moieties onto those tetraphenyl units. Instead, all we did was add a pretty simple templating step at the beginning of our synthetic route. Um, so, so this was a, a success, a big success in terms of maximizing the adsorption capacity of a porous polymer. We also tested this same material um, for its ability to capture similar divalent transition metals like manganese, nickel, or zinc out of water. Um, and this cobalt templated polymer ended up being very good at capturing all of those metals. Uh, and you can look at that in one of two ways. You can recognize that this templating step has um, really improved the transition metal binding capacity of, of a material, or you can feel disappointed that we haven't installed selectivity for cobalt in terms of trying to capture cobalt from a mixture of very similar ions. Um, I recognize that's a very high bar to set for my research group. You know. Um, cobalt two versus manganese two versus nickel two in aqueous solution are gonna be really similar, you know, very similar uh, ionic radii and charge density. Um, but this is the type of ultimate goal that we're going for. So in order to uh, improve the performance further, um, we are continuing to work on kind of engineering a more selective binding site and improving rigidity and decreasing swelling in these materials um, so that we could ultimately be able to selectively capture one transition metal cation. Uh, this is SC, these are SEM and TEM images of the three um, non-templated controls. You can see that, so it was the, uh, we've named them according to the tetraamine and whichever coupling partner it was with. This one in the middle is the, the triacyl chloride that we ended up templating. So anyway, all these non-templated polymers just have kind of a rough surface morphology. Um, and when you zoom in and look at them by TEM, you see that they are composed of these nanoscale sort of spherical agglomerated particles. Um, whereas electron microscopy of the templated material just looks extremely distinct. So um, this is an SEM image of the cobalt templated porous polymer, um, and it forms long sort of stringy rod-like particles that are really nothing like the, um, the rough surfaces that we saw before. If you zoom in and look at TEM images, you can see that these, like, so this right here would be um, the end of one of those rods. And there is also presence of some, some of these nanoscale spheres as well, which may be non-templated polymer. Um, what I'm saying with these images is that they sort of support the whole idea that the presence of cobalt ions and those cobalt monomer complexes has really um, done a lot to drive the resulting morphology and structure of the polymer um, when, when polymerized in the presence of those template ions. All right, so um, in conclusion, in, in this project, we were able to uh, really dramatically improve the cobalt capacity of a polymer by, in, in, by adding in a, a cobalt templating step to our synthetic route. Um, which didn't require any kind of laborious synthetic functional, functionalization of monomers. Um, we're continuing to target this, this range of different um, guest molecules for different aqueous separations in our porous materials. Um, and we're definitely looking at covalent organic frameworks and MOFs um, in order to leverage a greater amount of synthetic control that we will have in a, um, a more crystalline material. So, so a lot of this work was done when I was a fellow at Sandia National Labs. Um, so this is my current research group at the University of Maryland, as well as all of the different undergrads, postdocs, and scientists that I was collaborating with at Sandia um, to get this project going. So uh, that, that sums up my quick story, and um, I'm happy to take some questions now or later during the panel. Great, thanks a lot, Mercedes. I saw um, in our, in our Host chat, Craig had a question. Craig, do you want to chime in and ask one real quick? Hey, Mercedes, really nice work. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, some of them about the thermodynamics of the adsorption process, and if you have any temperature dependence of those guys to get activation energies, or if there's some parallels to uh, typical adsorption isotherms. 
<laughs> yeah, there are some parallels. I'm laughing because um, in gasorption, we have these gas dosing instruments that can just spit out an isotherm like this, but we did these experiments in triplicate. So like this data point is three experiments that I set up in an aqueous solution that I had to put polymer into. So um, it requires a lot more time and also like a lot more material to generate this type of isotherm. Consequently, this was done at, at room temperature and we, as of now, don't, don't have much information about temperature dependence. Um, it, it is like, it's, we were doing equilibrium experiments. So we let them shake overnight, but I uh, hypothesize that they equilibrate much more quickly than that. Uh, which leads me to another question. Can you use uh, some spectroscopic techniques to look at the the binding motif of some of these? Will it quench some certain vibrations, etc.? And one of the slides earlier, maybe it was three or four before now, showed some uh, really just before this. Those are super crystalline. <laughs> yeah. I, I am surprised about that. Unfortunately, we were like blasting through. We published this just this year as a communication. Um, and so we had this, the, everything on this slide is just the complexes, right? It's just that amino tetraamine with cobalt. Um, and this little plot over here is to show that our complexes look distinct, both from cobalt dichloride and from the organic monomer. Um, we haven't made an effort to, to sort of solve the structure of those um, cobalt monomer complexes any further. And yes, so one of the, the burning questions that we would, need, we would need to answer to go forward is like, what is the real cobalt binding environment in water in the polymer? And I think probably UV vis or something else fairly straightforward and spectroscopic would be able to tell us um, whether amines are, are continuing to coordinate cobalt in the same way that they do in these complexes. Um, the, the final polymer, there's actually a bit more complexity because the final polymer also has all these unreacted carboxylic acids from the other partner. Um, and I think those can also definitely participate in binding cobalt ions. Um, so it'd be really good to figure out which of those binding sites is, is winning out. Yeah, that interaction of a metal with those amines could be nicely suitable for an INS vision type experiment. Yeah, I was just about to chime in and, and tie your talk, Craig, to yours, Mercedes. It looks, you know, Craig, you showed some, um, like you said, different uh, bonding environments changing, like vibrational modes changing. Um, if this is the type of question that someone like Mercedes wanted to get at, you know, what's what's the flow for how much material you need, you know, how much modeling goes into it. Can you just give us like the, the 30 second overview of what that experiment looks like from kind of conception to analysis? Yeah, uh, what you put in is what you get out. So depending on how, how pristine or how pure uh, the total number of active sites you have in your material, that's gonna determine everything in the rest of the experiment. But say you've got a material that you're fairly confident has a high number of uh, something that you're interested in. Uh, you could do on vision, a few hundred milligrams, no problem, a few hours, no problem. There's a ton of hydrogen here, really straightforward. Vision has um, uh, a computational instrument scientist who can work with you, YQ, he's fantastic, uh, very collaborative, open, uh, to discussing how the best way would be to model this. Uh, he's, that's probably the most efficient route to, to figure out where to go for the, the theory side. And then it's, there's a bit of luck involved in, in going from this material particularly, because it, it's probably a little bit messy to something that's uh, publishable on the first shot, but it's, it's it, maybe 50% it, I'd be confident in this moving forward at this stage, given what I heard today. Thanks for the, the input. That's great. And so I guess the take home message is always talk to your, your instrument scientists, right? And so if, if someone's not familiar with vision is uh, Beamline 16 at the Splatian Neutron Source and uh, YQ Chang, Yong, Yong Cheng Chang is the uh, computational 
instrument scientist there. Yeah, he's close to being a genius, so he'd help you out. May I chime in with the same question I had before? Uh, in these particular materials, I see there is a lot of chlorine. And so both for Craig and for Mercedes, I, I, one of the chlorine isotopes has essentially no coherent scattering, um, while the other one has a strong one. So can something be learned about the structure by isotope substitution? Yeah, if you can make a model and substitute those things in and out, then sure, why not? It's just, it, is it interesting and worth the cost and effort? Well, I mean, you know, in, in, in as you know, in, in, in deuterium hydrogen substitution, a lot has been learned by just doing that. So I'm just wondering whether it's worth actually uh, trying this in chlorine business here. In this case, I'd say the, the chlorine is not the major obstacle to understanding the structures. And plus, uh, there may be some uh, larger scale morphology here. Small angle scattering might be another reasonable measurement that one could could make mm -hmm. yeah i think so um yeah excellent okay i want to be sure that we don't uh go over time if anyone who knows me and how i run zoom meetings i hate going over time and everyone has been doing a great job uh so far so let's keep it going thank you mercedes and if anyone has more questions for mercedes drop them in the chat um while we're still here and uh let's get hayden queued up I had, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I did not know we were on some kind of Swiss train schedule, but it appears that's what we are doing. So I will not hold the train up as much as I can. Um, great. great. Okay, should I go? Go for it. Yeah, we see your slides. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I have 15 minutes to sort of cover uh, whatever I get to choose to do. So I chose understanding gas capture compounds with neutron diffraction and spectroscopy. Very general, but I thought it might be more useful since we sort of alluded to it a little bit in that last part, so it's great. Sort of the practical things that you need to think about as you're doing the experiments and as the users that are like obviously watching right now, like what do you have to think about before you even um, consider doing some of these experiments, right? And then I'll talk about um, some of my own work that uh, Craig sort of alluded to at the end um, as sort of just like a vignette on uh, how you use the diffraction to sort of understand some gas capture, right? But first, I'll sort of introduce myself um, and who I am. I'm a synthetic materials chemist. Um, I work at the NCNR. I've been working with Craig for the past couple of years, but I work on lots of things outside of adsorbates. Uh, I work a lot on uh, adsorbate materials, but also a lot of solid ionic uh, materials and sort of like the unifying theme to a lot of my work, as many of you can appreciate, is sort of the structure property relationships, right? But as you can also appreciate, many of the moths and many of the adsorbates and many of these battery materials are highly complex. And a lot of the interesting properties come from understanding that complex structure, right? So really drilling down and understanding how to understand the diffraction, understand your local um, sort of environments from pair distribution function and spectroscopy, all of this comes together to really uh, do, some, some, do some great material science where you can understand the nitty gritty and you really squint um, so you can understand a lot about these materials, right? And, and picking up on something like deuterium in a, in a huge moth with like a 30 angstrom unit cell is, is no exception to that, right? And so I'll talk a little bit about those considerations. And so these are some general things for you to consider, right? And so Craig talked about this a little bit, and I think we talked about it a little bit there, right? But so understanding what you put in and what you get out is sort of what you're going to take from these sort of uh, experiments. So know as much about your material as you can before you come to the neutron or even just the x-ray facility in general, right? Before you go to these national labs, the more you know about the material, the more you can really make sure that your experiment is an effective use of time. Um, and and, and going to make for a great publication, right? Because especially for the neutrons, it's a finite resource and you might not show up at a neutron facility for maybe six months, 12 months out from when you even write your proposal. And so when you go there and you're given like two days of time, that might be all you get. <laughs> and you want to make sure you do it well, right? And so knowing your chemical composition and then knowing um, your, your impurities especially is really helpful, especially when you're talking about gas dosing systems, because there's a lot of things that get hidden in these patterns or in the spectroscopy that you really need to appreciate, right? 
And so Craig also talked about this, a couple hundred milligrams maybe for, for something on Vision or even doing PowGen or, or on BT1 and NIST, right? But for many of the MOFs, maybe you don't make that much of the material, right? So know that you're going to be testing a larger batch, right? So you need to understand, can you make this material on a relatively large scale and understand the properties and what you might expect, right? Know that these impurities may come into play. So you really got to characterize this material as best as you can. If you're doing gas dosing, uh, gas dosing, know how to activate material. This is probably, is there stuff left inside? This will complicate your refill refinements and it will complicate your INS, right? If you have stuff in there, it's going to show up. Many of your solvents are proteated, right? So you're going to see that really well in inelastic neutron spectroscopy or in quens, right? It'll start to convolute um, your conclusions. So you really got to think about how good is that material before you start to do it, right? If you're doing gas dosing, this seems so obvious, right? But you can, have you done isotherm measurements on the batch that you're going to send? Craig mentioned that we try to, we hot swap a lot of our gas dosing stuff, right? Because many things might have kinetic complications or implications where you have to dose at higher temperature, drop it down to something like 14 Kelvin. That might take a couple hours. You don't want to waste your neutron beam on waiting for your material to come to, to come to equilibrium, right? So you want to do this off of the beam, bring it on, try and swap, get as much out of your time as you possibly can, right? And then knowing exactly what pressure and temperature you're looking about. And then from a gas dosing perspective, right, there's two general flavors to the kind of gas dosing you do, a static pressure experiment or a stoichiometric uh, experiment, right? And so this is our setup. Craig showed it. This is the, the, the final iterations of it, right? But this is a known volume in this gas dosing cart. And that means that we can dose an amount of gas if we know how much material we put in here and we know sort of the expansion or, you know, we know how much volume we have in this before we open it up to the sample, we know how much gas we put in. And I'll show some INS data that Craig sort of alluded to and how that's important. But if you, if you have a really big moth, like something that can have multiple, multiple absorption sites, if you just blast it with like 700 tor worth of like CO2, you're going to have to find all those sites and you're going to have to rationalize what that means, right? So sometimes it's better to know I only put in a half millimole equivalent or half mole equivalent of gas to my material so that when you're doing your refill refinements that you know you can constrain that value or for the INS you know that there's potentially just going to be one site as you as you figure this out right because otherwise extra species will add extra peaks extra INS signal dubious quens analysis so a lot of complexity comes down talk to your beamline scientists talk to old man time Craig with his beard talk to any of the people at ORNL we're very knowledgeable about this stuff and we can help you do the best experiment that you want to to get the most out of your time right and so again from a diffraction before you do your experiment consider what you're looking for the element the phenomenon that you're most interested right so we're talking about the the great speaking the good word of neutrons right but sometimes the x-rays may also play a role. And I'll talk about <clears throat> one of those stories where we needed both the x-rays and neutrons. I would recommend using both because they're complementary. But the reason why we're talking about neutrons specifically for framework materials, right, is they're often as sensitive to the lighter elements as they are to the heavy ones. And in a metal organic framework or, framework or any of these porous materials, you're probably gonna have a mixture of both, right? There's also added contrast in the coherent neutron scattering length, right, where you might have negative and, and positive. So if you have like a mixed, metal uh, node on your moth, you're going to be able to distinguish them as well with the with the, the neutrons. And if you're wondering how do I even figure that out, well, the NIST has a website and you can go on this little uh, you know periodic table, pick the elements of composition, and you can start to think about how well you're going to be able to see, see the elements within your material, right? So carbon here, this coherent, coherent scattering length has like a you know six and six and a half. That's good. Um, something, you know, think about these absolute values, right? You also need to think about sort of absorption. If there's some other implications, if you put cadmium in there, it's just going to suck up all the neutrons, right? So that's something important to think about. So the the the, the example I'll, I'll show is like right. So Craig mentioned we used the vanadium moth. For those of you who've done neutron diffraction experiments, you'll know that you're putting it into vanadium cans and sealing it up. That's because vanadium is essentially invisible to neutrons, right? So trying to understand where what's going on with the vanadiums from the neutron diffraction is a bit of a, a bit of a lost cause. And so you have to do, we had to do complementary x-ray diffraction and do some joint refinements with the neutrons, with the x-rays to understand not only what was going on with the framework itself and the, the deuterium that we put in, right? So this has a, you know, almost as strong of a, or a, you know, large scattering length as, uh, as carbon to understand what was going on with the entire framework together, right? And this material itself was like a disaster sort of make. It's like the world's most sensitive moth. A slight breath and it'll just 
dissipate, right? So there's a lot of complexity to this whole project in general. But I'll also talk about sort of like from the spectroscopy perspective, we've said like, oh, hydrogen's in it, hydrogen's in it, right? This has a large incoherent cross-section. For diffraction, that can sometimes add to your background. I'll show you an example from my own work. You don't need to proteate your samples, but know that it, you, you need something with an incoherent, a large incoherent a scattering length here to be doing sort of the spectroscopy on things. Okay. And so this is an example of how these diffraction patterns sort of change, right? So this is not a MOF material, but this is a good example from uh, Rodriguez group, also at DMD, where you see sort of the differences between the patterns, right? You see the X-ray scattering pattern sort of dies off. That's a function of the X-ray form factor, whereas the neutron pattern holds constant. And that's because the scattering length is constant over Q, right? And so Q is this is normalizing, if you will, to, to, to the wavelengths. Um, so you can see there's a difference, right? So from the neutrons as well, you also get a lot of information out here um, at the high Q, which is that sort of, you know, local, your thermal parameters. So there's a lot of advantages to using neutron diffraction uh, in and of itself and when you, when you complement it with x-rays, right? And then from a, a, you know, a spectroscopy consideration, right? This is a, just talking about the gas dosing things that Craig sort of mentioned, right? Like how you do the experiments is important, right? And so without going into too much detail, you have hydrogen in this MOF, depending on the levels that you dose the hydrogen in. So these are, you know, mole equivalents of the, uh, to the cobalt here, right? You can see that you get these low energy, um, you know, energy transfers start to grow in. And then once you start to add more than one mole of equivalent, you start to access these other sites, right? But those sites then start to impact because they're having some sort of interaction with the hydrogens that have been absorbed, this peak starts to shift to the higher energies and this peak starts to shift to the lower energies, right? And then this gets more and more exaggerated as you get more and more details in, right? So there's a lot of information from the neutron spectroscopy when you also pair it with the diffraction, right? So they're, they're excellent experiments to do uh, together if you can get the time, right? Great work if you can get it. Um, but yeah, making sure you understand your material and the kinds of questions you're going to ask is so vital for these kinds of neutron experiments, right? Okay, so in my last five minutes, I'll talk about my own work, right? So we do carbon capture, or we have a big thrust in carbon capture, and you might wonder why is it important? Uh, we're all going to melt. Um, so we need to figure out ways to sort of mitigate the damage that we're doing um, at the moment and as well try to fix it going forward, right? So there's two flavors of carbon capture materials. There's those that sort of capture from a point source, so an exhaust stream like a coal plant, and then those that pull from like direct air capture, right? Pulling it straight from the 400 ppm uh, concentration in the air. Both of these are, are complicated in their own rights and you need to sort of find the right material for everything. And so the material that we've been looking at, and I'll forget, I'll, I'll skip some of the background and how we even got here, but know that the material we've been working on for like two years, basically, at this point, is aluminum formate. It is probably the most simple mock you can even devise, right? This is a very simple linker. It's, it's dead simple, but the material is so remarkable. It has an REO3 type structure. So it's like an A-site deficient perovskite. So you have these empty, empty sites in the center here. The thing that I would I'd say appreciate for this little short description I have here is that it has two cavities. It has a small cavity and a large cavity. The small cavity is defined by how these formate hydrogens point inwards and the large cavities, everything points away, right? So it's just sort of an empty space. And so if you look down different uh, directions of the, of the crystal structure, you see that it has channels, small and large channels as they alternate going back into the you know the a lattice parameter here and then those that have you have just only small cavities right and so we activated the material we've emptied it completely and we want to put something back in so we looked at how co2 goes into this material and you can see that it sucks up co2 and it does it at high temperatures and it does it really really well um, you can see that this like sort of peak absorption is on this high, you know, absolute pressure from this CO2 absorption isotherm is about 323 Kelvin, right? So that's 50 degrees Celsius. We're aiming into temperatures where we're coming off of an exhaust stream. And then that's where we're going to see the most use, we think, from this type of material, right? This is going to be a pretty, a pretty good carbon capture material in and of itself because it works at high temperatures. It has all these other benefits that I can't really go into, but you will see this work come out in the next two weeks. And I'll tell you right now, uh, it's been years that we've been working on this, so we're so excited to have it published finally, which is why we're talking about it now, right? Um, so neutrons, how do how do we use them, right? So I talked about how we did, you can have the two flavors of the, the gas dosing experiments, right? So in this instance, we did a static pressure. So we held different pressures over um, aluminum formate, and we saw how the, the cavities filled. We could do this 
because we know how this filled, right? We know you're only going to get sort of one CO2 based on size into this ultra microporous system. So here's that gas dosing collar that Craig talked about. Here's our vanadium can. The material goes in it. We dose it out air into our, our gas dosing manifold. We change the pressures and we can change the temperatures, right? This is a proteated sample, right? This is no deuteration required. So Craig was saying you might get a little bit of an increase in the background. You can see the slope. The sloping background is a, is, a, is a byproduct of this proteated sample, but you, you can see because it's so crystalline and it's such a beautiful sample to work with, there's no, there's no problems with doing the diffraction analysis, right? And you even get some contrast because the negative uh, scattering lengths from the hydrogen. As you dose the CO2 in, you get a change in the pattern, you can do your refelt refinement, and you can comment on what's going on structurally. And so what happens is that CO2 slips into the structure and it has this hand and glove relationship uh, with these small cavity uh, formate hydrogens, right? So you can see this hydrogen bonding length of about 2.42 angstroms. It's it's such a tight, beautiful fit that was destined to go in here. But you'll one of the things I skipped over is when you actually make this material straight up, you need to um, it has CO2 already embedded in it. But people who had discussed these materials prior hadn't figured out how to activate it, which is where our sort of contributions come in here. In the large cavities, you can see there's no hydrogen bonding, right? So the formates point away. And so you only get the sort of disordered crystallographic model of the CO2. And that's sort of a tumbling, sort of tumbling density of the, of the CO2 in here. And so from the crystallography, you can do this over different pressures, right? So as you dose CO2, as the more and more CO2 goes into the compound, you get a lattice contraction. That's atypical to most moths or adsorbents, right? They usually expand as you fill it up. That's coming from the hydrogen bonding effects of the small cavity, right? Like it's sucking itself up or, you know, breathing in. And then as you track the crystallographic occupancies of the CO2 that absorbed, you can now understand like the small cavity is being favored, whereas the large cavity is still filling, but to a lesser extent relative to the small cavity. And then I'll end with, you know, this material is not just good because it sucks up CO2, but because it's a molecular sieve. So those, this thing completely ignores nitrogen uh, on any reasonable sort of time scale and sucks up a considerable amount of CO2, right? So we're talking about a selectivity up in the hundreds um, at these elevated temperatures. And so a lot of this work has taken years and years and years, and it's been a great collabor collaboration between myself and Craig and, and Sir Tony Cheatham at, at UCSB and loads of our friends over at the National University of Singapore. And so with that, I'm gonna end, but I'll also say if you're interested, um, in, especially in understanding Craig's as long as his beard uh, Google Scholar page, uh, we talk about a lot of the neutron scattering studies for materials with hydrogen storage, right? So this is like a book chapter that myself, Ryan, and Ben, and, and Terry Yudovic and, and, and Craig put together. So take a look if you're interested. Uh, if you just Google sort of this, you'll find it. And with that, I will uh, open up the floor. If you have any questions in the Q&A, feel free to drop them in. I guess uh, I had one question. You're, you have your, you know, your drawing of your CO2 inside the structure. Is this something, you know, how often do you think you know where the CO2 is and build your model versus are you using like a Fourier map from the diffraction data? Like how often do you know where the molecules are going to be versus kind of make the diffraction data tell you where it is? Uh, you saw your whether or not I bias it? How dare you? No, um, it's a good point, right? You need to chemically understand your system. And some of, in many Craig's metal organic frameworks, right? You have these open metal centers. So your grand chemist thinking is like, well, it's gonna go to the metal center. That's what I designed, right? And so you're gonna look there. And in those bigger systems, huge maps, lower symmetry, it's really tricky. So you have to look at those Fourier difference maps. GSAS-1 does it really well. GSAS-2 mm, and Topaz less so much, right? But these are really great tools um, for, for doing that. With the ultra microporous system like ALF, you can just do the refinement, right? And the thermal parameters on these things are as stable as stable thing. I don't do rigid bodies. You usually do rigid bodies for the gases in these big moths. For for ALF itself, it's so small and it's such a high symmetry that you can just load the atoms in and it it finds its home and the thermal parameters are stable. Everything's stable because those are usually the canary in the coal mine for many for many refinements, right? It's those thermal parameters. So if they're not stable. Is it be, you got to start rationalizing whether or not that makes chemical sense? Is it because it's just a, a dynamic system and there's some movement, or is it is it wrong? And that comes with time and experience. That's the things that <laughs> we, you know, we spend years thinking about some of these things. So a good reason to talk to talk to the experts and the instrument scientists. Yeah. Uh, Matt Cliff. Oh, hi, Matt Cliff. Matt Cliff has a question in the chat. 
Is it a A plus, A plus, A plus tilt sequence? Is this something you can engineer? I mean, right. That's a great, uh, great question, Matt, very specific to you. Um, yeah, so um, it, it has a tilt sequence. So in something you could engineer um, in the sense of you're doing chemical doping or something along those lines, yeah, you can start playing with it. And, you know, we have previous work on a non-porous system with all the hypophosphites, right, that have all these wacky polymorphs with different tilting systems. And in some ways, you can engineer those if you can isolate the polymorphs that you're aiming at using whatever chemical mechanism, whether it's um, you know, the ionic radii that you're using to sort of induce the tilting system, or for some reason or another is the, is the chemical precursor you're using um, advantageous to getting one polymorph with one tilting system or not. And I, I guess, you know, you'd love to say as a chemist, you can design it and take a good step, but some of the most exciting parts in science is when it kicks you in the butt, right? And you're just like, well, I didn't see that coming. All right, let's see if we have any other questions. I have I a we comment. Pretty much got it. We're, we're, we're in question we're mode, Craig. I don't know if we're comments yet. No, I have a comment. Go for it. You're, you're right about uh, you got to be careful because there was just a, a publication in Nature Communications oh, yeah. where they, they were talking about the principles <laughs> of locating gas molecules in metal organic frameworks. And yep. uh, I, that was single crystal work, but they were putting this large molecule, uh, a dioxin, inside a metal organic framework in one paper. And someone did similar work and looked at their data and uh, no, apparently not. So I think I'll, 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 uh, I'll add on to Craig's point here, right? Some people think that powder diffractions are like a checkbox for any manuscript. Ah, I've taken the powder pattern, now I can publish, wonderful. But if you don't know how to do that proper analysis and you don't know how to squint and you're sort of being a little fast and loose with how you do that diffraction analysis, you're gonna run some major issues, especially with the gas dosing. So you gotta do the experiment right and you gotta be really carefully eyed when you do these refinements. Because as somebody who's only been doing them a couple of years, but when I walked in, it just has infinite ways to go wrong. And this is a testament to, to Craig and, and especially Ben Trump um, uh, who was at NIST, um, really teaching sort of the fundamentals and years and years and years of experience because it's, 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 it's tricky. It's tricky. You got to be really careful when you do these refinements. I am a mentor. Yay. <laughs> yeah, right. Pay it off. Okay, so it looks like we are, yeah, we're, we're good on time. So I'm going to start wrapping it up. I just want to... Um, Thank everybody for, for joining today, um, especially big thanks to Janelle Thompson at Oak Ridge uh, Neutron Sciences Division for you know, organizing everything, getting the talk set up. And our organizing team uh, on the Shug EC is Yun Lu from NIST, uh, me, Rebecca Daly, uh, Geneva Larita from Bates, uh, and, uh, and let's see who else is on here. And, uh, Igor Zelizniak, who's going to be our incoming chair. And also a big thanks to the instrument scientists at Oak Ridge who uh, helped us you know, put together this speaker lineup. And uh, if any other panelists have anything else to say, uh, chime in now. Just wanted to thank everyone for joining. And uh, remember to contact instrument scientists if you have questions about using neutrons. Right. As an incoming chair, I just want to add um, um, great thanks to um, past chair Dan Shoemaker, who took the lead in organizing this um, uh, excellent uh, symposium. This was a great idea and it worked great. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. But mostly right. Dan. <laughs> thanks, Janelle. Yeah. Okay, so we'll sign off now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.